hats off to the Nashville Police Department for taking out a complete coward. The stage is set. The crowds are taking their seats. Let's get ready to rumble. Brian Koberger is making friends and influencing people. Sam Bankman Freed bribes foreign officials gets charged for it. Should have done in America. It was just a campaign donation. Another politician in trouble. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment. Hit that little bell so you receive notifications. And remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Just type in Crime Talk. All right. Before we get to the docket, we need to pay the bills. How do we do that? Well, when you all go to crimetalksearch.com, that's how. Go there, sign up for a background subscription service. When you have that service, one which you can cancel at any time. So whether you do one background search or 100, you can keep it as long or as short as you would like. But that report is literally generated while you wait and you're gonna get information as to the person you're searching about here in the United States as to whether they have a criminal history. Uh, do they have liens against them? Judgments, um, are they married? Are they divorced? Are they telling you the truth? Check these people out. I'm telling you, you need to look into who you are getting involved with in a relationship. We've said it before, it is dating malpractice not to do a background search on somebody. And I'm not talking about a quick Google search. I'm talking about a background search. I'm telling you, it could save your life. All right, let's go ahead and get to the docket. Let's open the record for March 28th, 2023. Let's take a moment and watch the Nashville Police Department take out this coward. Yep, you gotta love America where you can look at body cams and see a coward, a coward whose goal was to get up in the morning yesterday there in Nashville and go kill three innocent children aged nine and three adults that were helping the youth of America become educated, productive members of society. But then a coward goes in there and shoots, like I said, a nine-year-old, Evelyn Dykehouse, Hallie Scruggs, and William Kinney, nine years old. Scruggs was the daughter of Chad Scruggs, who was actually the pastor at the, affili at the affiliated Presbyterian Church. And then the three adults were a substitute teacher, Cynthia Peake, head of the school, Dr. Catherine Kuntz, and a custodian, Mike Hill, all killed by a complete coward. Now, this complete coward is believed to be uh, this person, this woman by the name of Audrey Hale. And apparently she had some resentment towards the school, a school that she attended at some point during her childhood. And um, clearly Audrey Hale has some mental health issues. And um, we also know that she targeted the school after her initial target. Well, it had too much security. I've said this before, ladies and gentlemen, these school shooters are nothing but cowards. Why do they go to schools? They are soft targets. We've had the same stuff here at a high school just recently. Just the other day, a student shot two administrators. Now six people dead here in Nashville. These people are cowards. And what stops these bad guys with a gun? The good guys with a gun. And only if the good guys with a gun had been there, maybe they never even would have thought to go in there. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. You ever been to a gun store? What does everyone working behind the counter there carry? A firearm or two. You ever seen a gun store robbed in the middle of the day? No, you haven't. Why? Because it's not a soft target. I've told you this. I've represented criminals for 28 years. I've talked to them. What do they do when they go after somebody? They look for weakness. They look where they don't think they're going to get caught and it's an easy getaway. But the key thing is they look for weakness, ladies and gentlemen. And this Hale girl, she was going there because she knew there wasn't going to be any security. So let's take a look at this coward and let's see how she dives. I hope she got her wish. She apparently told a friend that morning. Oh, that's right. She said she was going to go tell a friend. She told a friend that she was going to die today. 
Of course, that friend didn't call the police and say, hey, something's not right. Somebody go better check on old Audrey. No, they didn't. So we know that Audrey drives up about 9.54 a.m. yesterday morning, 10.10, opens fire on some doors. They shatter, walks through them. Pieces of glass fall to the floor as most of the two double doors um, are broken, obviously, by the gunfire. Uh, she then steps through the frames of the destroyed glass door uh, with the debris, obviously, all around her. Hale then steps into the empty reception area of the church, which is adjacent to the school. At 1013, the first 911 call is made as the killer literally stocks rooms for victims. Hale is seen entering a carpeted room inside the church looking for more victims. The room seems empty as Hale exits it again in a short time after entering it. The first call to 911 about shots being fired in the building came approximately at that time. At 1018, Hale continues searching through the doors looking for more victims. Hale is seen on the same camera inside the church, still looking for victims, turning left and right and holding her rifle. She opens the door to the next room and steps inside. At 1019, the 28-year-old Hale continues to stalk around. Then she returns to the door and aims her gun, although there's no one there. She looks around, pointing her rifle. Just 30 seconds later, she tries another door. What a coward, hunting small children that are unarmed. I cannot, the garbage, she's just garbage. Anyway, she walks through the door, continues to go around. 1020, main school, walks past the reception and starts shooting. Hale is now through a wooden floored building labeled first in the footage past the empty reception area. She stalks the corridor, then disappears from view again. In the next seven minutes without footage, Hale shoots approximately six people. Coward. She shot and killed head teacher Catherine Kuntz in the hallway in an assassination style killing, in addition to shooting the custodian Mike Hill and substitute teacher Cynthia Peake. Hale also murdered, like I said, the three nine-year-olds. Let that sink in. Coward nine-year-olds. 1027, Hale's finally shot dead on the second floor of the school. She engaged officers who fired back and killed her. So at least we know the cops are better shot than Miss Hale. Take a look at that one more time. Take a look at that. Those cops taking her out. God bless them. I tell you, cowards. And you know what the sad thing is? When I woke up this morning and on the radio, what were people talking about? The big controversy, not that this Miss Audrey Hale uh, killed six people and three nine-year-olds. No, no, no. They're not outraged at that. No, people are outraged that the police department apparently weren't using the correct pronouns. Okay, this just shows you how out of touch with reality we are these days. Three innocent people dead, three children dead, completely innocent. And all people want to do is use this for their own political agenda by saying you need to use the killer's correct pronouns. Yeah, I got some pronouns. She's dead. He's dead. They're dead. How's that? Next on the docket, Lori Vallow. Let's get ready to rumble. That's right. The trial is scheduled to begin next week. Ladies and gentlemen, on the defense team, we have Jim Archibald, who's been a public defender for over 30 years and has been assigned to at least 27 homicide cases and at least five death penalty cases. Also accompanying him in the tag team match is John Thomas. He's been a defense attorney since 2005, and he previously worked as a prosecutor in Bingham County. Although they came to the game late, they are winning. Now, John Thomas, does he not remind you of John Candy or Chris Farley every time you see him? I think he does, but he's doing a bang-up job. Over here in this corner, we have the government. The prosecutor's Rob Wood from Madison County. Been the prosecuting attorney since 2020 after serving five years in the office as a young deputy. Lindsey Blake is the Fremont County prosecuting attorney also elected in 2020, and then the hired gun for the prosecution, Rachel Smith, from Missouri with over 25 years of experience in homicide and death penalty cases. Bringing up the rear is Spencer Rammel and Tanya Rawlings are also prosecutors on the team. 
So far, all of them have years of experience, but they already look dazed and confused before the bout has even begun. They've missed deadlines, and they've been more concerned with money issues than achieving justice. We will see if they can get their act together and rally against the heavy burden of proof that is required of beyond a reasonable doubt. And the judge or the referee for this bout is District Court Judge Stephen Boyce. After 20 years of private practice, he was appointed to the bench in 2019. He definitely started off favoring the prosecution, but he seems to have been getting his sea legs after repeated blunders by the prosecution. And he may also be trying to minimize the prejudice of setting Lori Vallow's trial outside of her speedy trial by dismissing the death penalty. And let's not forget the main contender, although we doubt we'll hear from them throughout the match, Lori Vallow, charged with first degree murder, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft. The brawl will be over whether the government can prove Lori Vallow's involvement in the allegations of conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception for the death of Tylee Ryan. First degree murder of the death of Tylee Ryan, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception for the death of J.J. Vallow, first degree murder for the death of J.J. Vallow, conspiracy to commit first degree murder in the death of Tammy Day Bell, that's right, husband number five's previous wife, and grand theft. Was there a conspiracy, an agreement between two or more people to commit an illegal act? Did the evil dead guy, her brother, Alex Cock, do it without Lori's knowledge? We're gonna have to wait and see if $3.6 million gets you justice or just a bunch of bad press for small town prosecutors. The questions will all be answered. April 24th. Remember, get your tickets now. Let's get ready to rumble. Brian Koberger, making friends and influencing people. Apparently, a new inmate has threatened to kill the Idaho quadruple murder suspect, Brian Koberger. And um, apparently threats are quite numerous to Koberger and that the uh, deputies at the jail um, are having to deal with nonstop threats. The deputies have even had to move uh, Mr. Koberger to another location in the jail. Don't be alarmed. The deputies, it's their job to make sure nothing bad happens to Brian Koberger because you know if he got injured, he'd sue. So you can't let anything bad happen to him. The state is going to first give him a fair trial because we'll give him the presumption of innocence. And then if he is ultimately convicted, he'll get the firing squad because they just passed that last week in Idaho. Next on the docket, Sam Bankman Freed. Oh, yes. One man's bribe is another man's political contribution. Go figure. That's right. Sam Bankman Freed allegedly paid a $40 million bribe to at least one Chinese government official to unfreeze $1 billion worth of cryptocurrency. This all came out in a new superseding indictment. The federal prosecutors in Manhattan have now charged Sam Bankman Freed with directing the payment in cryptocurrency in order to unfreeze accounts belonging to his hedge fund, Almeida Research. The Chinese authorities had frozen that account back in November of 2021, and the accounts held more than 1 billion of cryptocurrency, according to prosecutors. Now, once those assets were unfrozen, the indictment alleges that Sam Bankman Freed authorized another transfer of tens of millions of dollars of additional cryptocurrency to complete the bribe. So now there are 13 new international bribery charges then increase the pressure on old Sam Bankman Freed, who has previously pled not guilty to the eight counts of defrauding investors by using their money to plug losses there at his hedge fund, Almeida. The new indictment and his uh, uh, the new indictment against Sam Bankman Freed and his associates alleged that he uh, tried numerous methods to unfreeze the accounts back in November of 2021, but after both legal and personal efforts failed, Bankman Freed agreed to and directed the multi-million dollar bribe, hmm, hmm, political donation, intended for the benefit of one or more of the Chinese government officials uh, to make sure that that account got unfrozen. Can you imagine that? Government officials taking money for uh, helping out a constituent like that? Oh my God. Like I said, if only he had done this in America, it could have been just a campaign contribution. But under the Foreign Corrupts Practices Act, it is illegal. He then allegedly used the money to help fund Almeida's uh, failing trades and then was able to uh, defraud customers and investors 
for another year before the cryptocurrency exchange finally imploded. Obviously, SBF was ultimately uh, declared bankruptcy in November of 2022. And that obviously led to the, um, well, you know, the discovery of all those missing funds. Now, old Sam Bankman Freed is facing federal and civil um, allegations from both the Securities and Exchange Commissions and the Commodity Futures Trading Commissions. And with this new indictment, he is charged with 13 counts of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act alleged violation, which make it illegal for U.S. citizens to bribe foreign government officials to win business. You know what? My gosh, they should come up with a law like that here in the United States, don't you think? Wouldn't that be crazy? You couldn't pay politicians to win business. Huh. Wow. How? Wow. We should really give that a shot. Hmm. Someone should really get around to that. Anyway, uh, the judge uh, overhearing the case has scheduled a court appearance for Thursday for an arraignment uh, as it relates to the superseding indictment, where undoubtedly Mr. Sam Bankman Freed will um, continue his pleas of not guilty. Somebody at the United States Attorney's Office should probably, if the judge doesn't raise the issue on himself, want to revoke Mr. Sam Bankman Freed's uh, bond. Uh, this guy is clearly a danger to the community, a flight risk, and um, there's got to be money stashed all over the world that he could get access to. And um, let's face it, the guy's going down. He's going to prison. Why is he in custody? Start your sentence now. Get that pre-sentence confinement credit before you get your conviction. Get in there. Go do a proffer. Try to minimize the losses as much as you can. Help the government recover as much money as you can. Maybe it could save yourself five maybe a decade of time. I'm telling you, the longer they go, the more the government is going to find on you. You should have pled guilty when those first original eight counts came down, and then they really couldn't come after you anymore. Anyway, next on the docket, rules for thee, but not for me. And while we're on that subject, I got lots of comments. They're like, oh, you talked about a Republican that got in trouble. Uh, we talk about Republican and Democrats that get in trouble. We don't care what party they are. They're all the same once they get there. How do we loot the public treasury and how do we help our friends get business in or from the public treasury? So we despise them all, ladies and gentlemen. We're not one-sided. We're not for one side or the other. Next, a city councilwoman who crashed into a parked car and left the scene last year was never cited nor subject to a sobriety test after she called the town's police chief shortly after being pulled over and uh, he intervened. Huh, could you imagine such a thing? That's almost like someone was attempting to influence a public official or even bribery. Anyway, this crash happened minutes before midnight on November 12th and reportedly came as Kayla Menard Rowe, a councilwoman in Louisiana, was on her way home from a visit with the aforementioned chief who physically came to the scene after her call. She's a lifelong resident of Youngsville, Louisiana, the city she currently serves. And Roe is also the daughter of the town's former police chief. It's almost like they take care of their own. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, take a look at some of this body cam footage that shows Roe cracking jokes, letting off some, uh, you know, expletives and giving officers contradictory answers as they question her about the crash which left both her and another woman's car undrivable. The woman, Youngsville resident Sherry Guidry, said that she was awoken to the sound of a deafening crash and the blinding lights that night while sleeping at the guest bed of her friend Sugar Mill Pond home. She says she's still working to pay the $25,000 bill after no sobriety test was administered to the councilwoman and no citation was given. Despite footage, showing the councilwoman maybe being signs of uh, intoxication. Officer asks, have you been drinking? Hmm? The councilwoman responds, no. Yes, possibly. Who explains she's just driven back from Alabama with her son who's considering attending college in Birmingham. The officer, you know, while surveying the damage wrought by the driver, appears less than convinced. It's either yes or no, the officer responds. The councilwoman, cradling her face in her hands at one point, um, appears to be somewhat undeterred, answering no. The footage then shows how the city councilwoman remained uncooperative with officers until the chief, that's right, the police chief arrived. 
little over 10 minutes later. At that point, when an officer asks for her phone number to give a towing company, the city councilwoman replies with a rendition of Tommy Two Tones' 1981 song, 8675309. Ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you like it if we all had friends in high places and this kind of stuff just never happened to you? Well, the police officer, um, the chief, defended his actions, saying it had nothing to do with his uh, f- previous family relationship uh, with the city councilwoman's daughter, and also said, hey, you know what? There's really no written policy here for conducting sobriety tests or issuing citations at the scene of the crashes. Well, there you go. Let's not do an investigation because somebody in a position of power uh, did something wrong. It's going to be embarrassing to them, and we're going to help out a friend. And then we'll just say there's no policy as to how to do that, so we just didn't know what to do next. Really? I bet you that police chief would know what to do next if you or I hit a parked car and uh, we showed indicia of intoxication. Don't you think? I do. Let me know in the comments. I think that police chief should resign. I really do. And the city councilwoman as well. Rules for thee, not for me. As a pet owner, you want to give your furry friend the very best. That's why baked in Colorado CBD infused dog treats are the perfect choice. These delicious treats not only taste great, but they also provide a wide range of health benefits for your pet. CBD has been shown to have many positive effects on dogs, including reducing anxiety, alleviating pain and inflammation, and improving overall wellness. Baked in Colorado's treats are infused with premium, full-spectrum CBD oil, meaning your pet will benefit from the whole plant extract. Not only that, but Baked in Colorado's treats are made with all-natural human-grade ingredients, so you can feel good about what you're giving your pet. They're also free from wheat, corn, and soy, making them a great option for dogs with food sensitivities. Baked in Colorado CBD-infused dog treats are the perfect way to support your pet's health and well-being. With various flavors, including peanut butter, pumpkin, and bacon, your dog will love them too. So why wait? Head to www.bakedincolorado.com today and order your dog a bag of these delicious and nutritious treats. Your pet will thank you for it. Finally today, our dumb criminal. Take a look at this moron. Okay, he started with the intent to break into this house, going through an alleyway from the corner of the house. Um, The dumb criminal here is seen sucking in his stomach to squeeze in between the house and a fence while carrying a garbage can over his shoulder. He then removes a piece of wood from the garbage can, walks towards the back of the house, and then disappears for several minutes. At about 12.05, he returns into the camera view again while still carrying the piece of wood, but he ditched the garbage can. He walked up to the window on the side of the house, laid down the wood. He then attempted to remove a screen from the window but the knucklehead couldn't figure it out. He eventually removed the screen, but could not get the window open. He stood around looking somewhat uh, befuddled and looking at the mess he made, and then he picks up his piece of wood again. Using the wood, this guy then begins slamming the glass window in an attempt to force entry into the house. This buffoon uh, then stood looking confused and ultimately gives up. Still, not deterred apparently, The dumb criminal walks around the back of the house and up to the opposite side of the driveway, still carrying the piece of wood. He suddenly tries to conceal his identity and pulls a hood over his head. How many times have we talked about identity? It's the most important thing. Then the knucklehead pulls his shirt sleeves over his hands to avoid leaving fingerprints while he tried to open the doorknob, but the door was locked. He had already left fingerprints on the garbage can, the screen, and the piece of wood and the window. The idiot then used the piece of wood to try to pry open the doorknob, and when it didn't work, he attempted to ram the door open with his shoulder. When that failed, he attempted to push inward on the doorknob with his hand. He once again pulled his sleeves over both his hands and tried to manipulate the doorknob. Well, and that didn't work. Finally, he used the wood in another attempt to pry open the doorknob. The last time, this last time, he was successful. The criminal then enters the house about 12.08 p.m. and closes his door behind him. At 12.27, after being in the house for roughly about 19 minutes, the criminal emerged from the same door carrying a bucket with a lid over it. He looked up toward the camera as he closed the door behind him and exited the property through the rear. And he forgot to put his hoodie back up to protect his identity. All right, this this unidentified knucklehead is our dumb criminal of the day. First, 
Why? Don't take other people's things. Don't go into your, somebody else's house. You're lucky you don't get shot. Third, <laughs> you left your fingerprints everywhere. Fourth, you're on video camera the entire time, you idiot. And you didn't cover your head. You are a dumb criminal. That, sir, is why the police and people who do criminal defense work will always be needed. Yeah, chat GBT, not taking away my job when we got geniuses like this out there. All right, that's all we have for you today. I don't know, feel a little fired up today. I think that coward in Tennessee just really, just really upset me. Oh, drives me nuts. Cowards like that. Why don't they pick on somebody their own sides? They won't because they're cowards. That's all we have. See you next time. Mm-hmm.